today the topic that has been given to me is Sanatana Dharma and the West, what is the relationship. I want to start by describing Indian civilization which is inseparable from Sanatana Dharma. And Sanatana Dharma is not just spirituality and your relationship with God. It's also your relationship with nature, your relationship with community, your relationship with your body, with your family, society, this. And we do not have a separation of science and religion, sacred and profane, like in the West. The dharma includes what we call science, includes mathematics, includes astronomy, includes medicine, Ayurveda. So when you talk about this, you're really talking about the whole Sanskriti, the whole civilization. And I've been pursuing a project in my foundation to, do, to develop a series of books, very academically written research books on the history of Indian contributions to science and technology. That is to do away with this myth that dharma is only mystical and does not, ignores material world. We are often told that you know, we need West to intervene and help us in practical things because West is progressive, scientific, technological, they have medicine, they have human rights, they can, they can keep the streets clean, they have public health, all these things. But actually this is a misnomer because for most of the history of India, the civilization has been also very practical. Until 1750, uh, according to the Cambridge History of Economics, World Economics, India had like 25% of the world GDP and China had about the same, little bit higher. So Asia had like altogether about 60% of the world GDP and the West, which included North America plus Europe combined, was less than 20%. After 100 years, which means from 1750 to 1850, India's share declined from 25% to less than 2% and China's share declined to about 3% and this entity called West grew from under 20% to over 80% of, of world share of economics. So the industrialization of Europe overlapped and coincided with the deindustrialization of India. It's very important. And when they write about the industrial revolution, they make it look like the genius of the English people. What they don't tell you is the first two industries in the industrial revolution of England were textiles, which had been a great industry of India, not coincidental, and steel, which was also a great industry of India. Indian textiles had been legendary since the ancient times. You see mention in Roman archives Greek archives. In fact, they are criticizing that the aristocrats are wasting a lot of money of the national treasury buying very sophisticated products from India, including textiles. It's a criticism. The balance of trade is going uh, because India would only accept gold since there was nothing made in Europe which India had, India didn't have. So India would supply finished goods. And they were those people like the third world in those days. And they had to pay in gold. And so India amassed a huge gold reserve, not mined in India. The gold mining in India throughout history has been very tiny. Most of the gold reserve in India has been imported, still imported today also. Because in those days, it, in the export of Indian goods was so prized that the only thing Indians would, would want in return would be gold. The other very big tex, uh, export of India was steel. The, there was a kind of steel, very, very tough, from which swords were made because that sword could break the shield of the opponent. And if you made your shield out of that steel, it was called Woods steel, W-O-O-T-Z, steel, Woods steel, it's a certain kind of steel. If you made your armor out of that, it would not get broken. So the side which had wood steel would have an advantage in armor and weaponry. So Romans and Greek and 
or during the Ottoman Empire when the Muslims ruled, they were buying these kind of steel from India. Now it's not coincidental that these two major products of India were made to, were de-licensed. You probably don't know that the British banned the production of iron and steel in India as made it a criminal enterprise because they said this could be used to make guns and this would support terrorism and insurrections against the British and all that. That was the reason given. And, a lot, and uh, the British set up a huge industrial complex in England that started the industrial revolution, textiles and steel. And you might not know that uh, when they were making the Tower Bridge in London, the East India Company did a survey on where to get the steel from. And you, this is the archives of the East India Company. A scholar called Dharampal, who died some years ago, he went in, in the last few decades and dug up all this and wrote books on it. Uh, the British East India Company concluded that the best steel at the cheapest price was to be imported from India. So large part of the steel used in the tower bridges from India. Many people don't know this. So this business that dharma means otherworldly is not correct. It is not correct because how would you explain the civil engineering of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro and the whole Dholavira, the earliest port and the water management and the sewer system and all of these things are not characteristic of a society which is otherworldly and escapist and uh, believe everything is Maya and you don't have to worry about uh, your neighbor and you don't have to worry about the well-being of society. Then such a society would not have produced these things. Shipbuilding was a very major industry. You find some of the early shipwrecks indicating and some of the trade documents indicating very large ships uh, from China and India compared to the ships in other countries. A uh, scholar of history, uh, Portuguese history, who is a professor in University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, wrote on, he, he uh, tracked the Portuguese empire, so he went to various places including Goa. And he wanted to find out what was the economic activity of the Portuguese empire. And he found out that Goa, he, he had the Indian government giving permission to go to some places where documents, old documents were stored that nobody had looked at. He looked at only one of many, uh, you know, uh, piles of document. So we don't even know what's, what else is there. And he found that the documents of trade, which were very accurately maintained, showed that Portuguese were importing huge amounts of plant medicine. What is classified as spices was not, you know, ginger and turmeric, you don't build a whole empire on spice rack. But plant medicines, which were used for food also, so they could be called spices, but they were really plant medicine, medicinal use. And Portugal was importing these and re-exporting them to all of Europe, supplying all of Europe with plant medicines from India. That is a huge source of wealth of the Portuguese. We don't think of India as a supplier of science, technology and practical things, but this is what, what the facts are. Also, we think that Indian knowledge workers going overseas is something recent. People like you, many of you, is something recent. But archives of the Arabs, Persians, talk about Indian doctors and, and university professors and surgeons and uh, people of that kind, musicians, you know, in, in thousand years ago also in the Middle East. So Indian knowledge workers were very well respected. Chinese uh, emperor used to bring some of the top appointments used to be uh, people from India in the laboratory of mathematics and astronomy and medicine used to be from India. Very uh, official and very open. The mathematics of uh, India was exceedingly instrumental in uh, world mathematics. Often credit is given to the Arabs, but you might not know that the word algebra comes from al-jabr, al-jabr, al is the, you know, like al-jazeera or al-qaeda or al-something, you know, al-hind was the name for India. Al-jabr was a person who translated texts from Sanskrit, Malayali, various Indian languages into Arabic 
and in the preface he says this is the translation of such and such text, Indian text. And a couple of centuries after that, the Europeans discovered these texts and translated them into Latin. And that is how a lot of this mathematics entered Europe. And this mathematics became known as algebra because it was the work of algebra, they thought. But algebra himself acknowledged that this is of Indian origin. So a lot of the, lot of European cathedrals during the Ottoman Empire and later were attributed to Arab influence because they say Arabs had the mathematics which Europeans didn't have. Arabs knew how to make arcs, very exact things. But Indians had that mathematics. Indian cities had been built for a very long time with all these very complex, uh, you know, things. The tiles in the Indus Saraswati civilization have a aspect ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 4 if you look at the dimensions. There are many sizes but they have that aspect ratio. The weights have that aspect ratio, the weights 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, like that. And if you look at the standardization, it's very amazing that a civilization half, as large as half of Europe, if you look at the overall territory, had such a huge uh, consistency from one place to the other, even from even over, over a period of 2,000 years, it's consistency. Now you would think that, the Western mind would think that to have so much consistency in, in standards, you need a stand, centralized organization. You need an organization which is one factory making all the tiles or some standard emperor, ruler, authority. But the, the, there is no evidence of a central controlling point, headquarters. There's no, there are, it's a very decentralized, many, many towns and each town has got one bedroom, two bedroom flats with the bathroom and running water. And there seems to be a very large middle class. It, in the cities in the Middle East, there would be one big structure made of stone for the emperor and then people lived in tents which vanished. So most of the old cities you don't see a large, large uh, cons permanent construction for population. You see only for the emperor to live in grand style and everybody else would be living in tents. But in, in the Indus Valley civilization there is no big fortress like the Red Fort or uh, you know, big Rashtrapati Bhavan or some big, some big palace for the emperor, Buckingham Palace. There, it's all fairly uniform, uh, middle class. So it seems like a decentralized society, decentralized society, and yet very uh, high standard of consistency, which we still don't know how this kind of thing would be possible. India also exported a lot of linguistics, a lot of grammar, a lot of language influences. A lot of the Buddhist tales, uh, Buddhist stories made their way into Europe and they've been re-Christian, they've, re, they've been Christianized and Westernized and their Buddhist origins forgotten. What scholars will tell you, Western scholars who specialize in this will tell you the uh, Indian origins. And linguistics, uh, until Sanskrit was discovered and its closeness to some European languages, especially German, was discovered in the 18th century. Uh, linguistics in Europe was very uh, kind of uh, rudimentary. It was not a very scientific study of language and scientific study of grammar. But once they discovered Panini, they realized that uh, one can have a very formal, mathematically perfect, standardized, you know, very logical and consistent, rigorous grammar. Uh, and that launched the study of linguistics in Europe. And until 1900, uh, anybody wanting a PhD in any major Western University was required to first study Sanskrit and Panini to get the foundation and then he could study in any other linguistics. But then they eventually they took the, the Paninian thought process and mapped it onto European languages so now you can bypass Sanskrit. But that's the origin of modern linguistics. It's a, it's a pretty amazing story. The, some of you have, our generation did not study something called postmodernism, but in, uh, if you have kids who are studying humanities and liberal arts, then they'll be studying postmodernism. It's very fashionable. Especially in India, those who are studying uh, English honors and who are studying humanities, they're all into postmodernism. It's a very trendy 
uh, it's beyond the modern thought, postmodern thought. What they often don't, what they generally don't tell you, is that the person who's considered to be the founder of something called structuralism is a man called Ferdinand Saussure, a French man called Ferdinand Saussure, and he's considered to be the originator of a system of thought called structuralism, and then that was developed into post-structuralism, that became postmodernism, and this happened around 1900. And what you need to know is Ferdinand Saussure was a Sanskrit professor. His PhD was in Panini's grammar. So you can see the origin of these ideas and the role of Panini was not only in linguistics but also in many kinds of thought in the humanities. And the uh, European Enlightenment is often credited to, you know, German thinkers, French thinkers, but most of these were very well read in Sanskrit. They were Indologists or they were debating with Indologists, they had Indologist friends. And so now a few books have come out recently on the Indian influence on uh, the Enlightenment movement in Europe to show that uh, this, this was not something totally internal. There was a lot of uh, input from the mining that they did of uh, uh, Indian thought and also uh, Chinese thought. And uh, the influence on Christianity also, huge influence on Christianity from Hinduism and Buddhism since early days. I, in fact, one of the books I'm writing is dedicated to uh, how Hindus, Hinduism and Buddhism have been mined by a series of prominent uh, Christian theologians from, from the last 100, 150 years. I'm picking 10 very famous theologians and showing how each of them is very well read. And he, he, they, in fact, some of them appreciate Vedanta, some of them like one system of Vedanta versus another system of Vedanta. They comment on it, they criticize Christianity, then they start finding parallels, then they start looking for how the, these great ideas can be grafted into Christianity, then they try to upgrade Christianity, then they have a debate with, their, with other Christians who don't believe in it, and they gradually, gradually try to convince them. So this type of a digestion of Hindu thought into Christianity to help Christianity reform itself, upgrade itself, upgrade its philosophy is a very fascinating study which I'm going to do in a separate book. Now, the, and then this goes on, there is influence on music, there's influence on dance, there's influence on aesthetics. Play Shakuntala influenced a whole lot of German theater and uh, Western theater uh, in, the, in the modern era. So I decided that uh, in, the, in the year 2000, uh, we, we wanted to uh, produce these volumes on history of Indian science and technology and its contributions to the world. And we started with a goal of 20 volumes. Uh, each to be done by a prominent scholar, well-known, world-class person, reviewed by independent reviewers. Each takes three years, sometimes five years to do. And uh, somebody called Joseph Needham in Cambridge had done 30 volumes on China's contributions. And it made a very big impact in the world because wherever there's China studies, they're studying the contribution of China. Whereas India's studies is usually through India's problems, caste system, minorities, abusing women, dirt, filth, this, that. So India is sort of a source of problems rather than a source of solutions. And this is very fashionable to do. So I thought that India also needs a balance with uh, study of India's contributions. And we're trying to do 20 volumes. We finished nine. Five of them we have there. Uh, the other four I'm going to come bring from India. And the rest of the, after the nine, we are trying to get more out. But the idea is that uh, we, want, we want to challenge this view that Indians are otherworldly, mystical, don't have practical sense, not very, you know, like I was giving a talk in Toronto. So one guy asked the question, uh, you're talking about the difference in your book, but I think the main difference is we are mystical and Westerners are materialistic. I said, this is not true, this is a stereotype. We, we are mystical and we are also materialistic. Westerners are mystical and Westerners are also materialistic. The differences are more sophisticated and deeper than that. So I wanted to, whenever I get a chance to talk about our dharma civilization and the West, I want to emphasize the interaction between the, the dharma and the West where we have been a contributor also. How the West has contributed is very well known. 
but that part of the story is always talked about. So the the history of Indian civilization is also is often described as a layered layered cake, one one layer of foreign influence after the other, after the other, after the other. So according to this theory, everything came from outside, and we were basically uncivilized tribes. Getting each invasion helped us civilize. So the more we get invaded, better for us. So if we have a problem, we should now invite somebody to civilize us. <laughs> so often people say, sir, who's better for us, the Chinese or the Russians or the Americans? Like, you know, we have to be adopted now, who's the best parent? The Indians still think like that. So according to this uh, invasion theory of India, you know, there's nothing going on until the so-called Aryans came from somewhere. This is the idea. Yeah? And they brought Sanskrit and Vedas. And then Greek came and they brought philosophy. So we learned how to philosophize and mathematics. And then others came, brought different things. And then uh, Muslims came and they brought uh, sitar and chicken tikka and tabla. <laughs> yeah? And then British came and they brought cricket and uh, railways. Yeah. And uh, now Americans are coming and they should bring us human rights. And, and you know, advances further. So this is the foreign civilization theory of India. Uh, you may think it's weird and funny, but the vast majority of Indians I come across were well educated in media and in academics, the textbooks, simply assume this. And to give the factual, like I'm telling you I'm doing 20 volumes and I give you some examples. Just presenting this is attacked like you are some chauvinist, you must be some nationalist guy, you must be working with BJP, you must be some saffron. I mean, this is just basic history we are talking about, that's all. So, this is a very serious uh, problem that uh, we face. Now, another dimension to the Sanatan Dharma relationship with the West is how it shaped the West's own identity of itself, not just material things like textiles and steel and these kinds of things, but the Western identity of itself. This is a very fascinating story and a previous book I did, not the latest being different, but before it called Breaking India, big yellow book which is available there, Breaking India, starts with a few chapters and I'll give you a synopsis. The first few chapters explain that when the proximity of Sanskrit with European languages, especially German, was discovered, it was a huge opportunity for Germans to reimagine and reconstruct their own identity and to rebuild a history, a sense of ancient history for themselves. Until then, Germans didn't have a sense of nation. There was no grand past, there was no grand narrative. You need a sense of great history to feel that you are a nation. So, the French had a sense of great past, the Renaissance. You know, the French are the people, successors of the Renaissance. Their past comes from the great Renaissance, the Latin culture. And so they had a sense of how great they are. And the British had a sense of we own the empire. The British are the great British empire. So their sense of world greatness came from empire. Germans did, were not part of the Renaissance, uh, inheritance of the Renaissance, and that was not possible as a sense of identity, nor did they have any empire. So the Germans really had no way to build a nation, because the Europeans constructed nations on a sense of constructed, imagined historical greatness. They had to. And Germans were called barbarians. If you really look up, the, the, the barbarians were Germans. And Germans, the textbooks around Europe, including in Germany, talked about how the barbarians were people who destroyed civilization. They, they just done barbaric things. The Germans had an inferiority complex at that time. And so the discovery of uh, Sanskrit and German link was very big news. And Germans started mining. The first relationship the German thinkers had with Sanskrit 
was a great romance for Sanskrit, for Vedas, and for India as the land of origin. It's very, very fascinating. In the late 1700s, uh, like Frederick Schlegel and Herder, these were people who wrote about India as our homeland, India as the mother civilization, India is where we come from. And there were all these theories about you know, how all of us came from India and uh, uh, the, we are closer to, our language is closer uh, bec as because we are close, we are the real Indians, they would say. And the other Europeans are degraded, inferior Indians because they're not as close. So India was the uh, gold standard of who's civilized. Very interesting. And this movement was called the Romantic Movement. Romance for the past, generally past of India. And French had a French Romantics also. And the British had a British Romantics also. There were three, I'm discussing this in a few chapters in the book Breaking India, but in another volume in the future, I'll have a whole book on just that period, the history of Indology. You see, then what happens is, some of these people, like Frederick Schlegel, the early part, he's, uh, he believes that India is the origin of the Germans. Then he has a religious conversion. He converts to a certain form of Christianity. He marries somebody. Uh, it changes his whole posture. And he then begins to try to separate uh, the Vedic religion from the rest of uh, Sanskrit. He wants to separate it out. And he wants to own, he wants to take ownership of the Sanskrit, but minus the religion somehow. So he wants to downgrade and uh, reject the religion he considers pagan because it would not fit, it would conflict with Christianity while accepting the wonderful civilization. And he has a hard time making it work. He's struggling with this system. And he's in argument with a lot of people. Many other people he's debating with. In, in, and Hegel is involved at that time also. Gradually, this German movement continues where they want Sanskrit, but they don't want to consider India to be the origin of Sanskrit. They construct this idea that they must have been an Indo-Aryan people. And then the Indo-Aryan become Indo-European. Because the, the, to, to hyphenate European means we and Indo are somehow linked. And then they start questioning where were these Indo-Aryans and Indo-Europeans originally from. And so competing theories start. Some say they must have been Germans. Some say they must have been from Central Asia, Russia, various places like that. That is how the Aryan, foreign Aryan theory originates. And then Max Miller makes a, just a theory because he's working for East India companies are paying him to do these translations of Sanskrit texts. And the British love this idea, of this theory of foreign Aryans having originally brought civilization into India. Because the British start saying that we, the British, are merely continuing the same project. We are finishing the job which our ancestors started. And the people of India should be told how grateful they are. They should be very grateful that previous Europeans did not finish the job. There is still a lot of problem in India. So we have come to finish the job. So this is uh, Civilization of India Release 2.0. The early Aryan was 1.0. So the British feel that it fits nicely to their story. Yeah. And very foolishly, a lot of Indians buy into this. And then a different group of British, uh, Robert Caldwell, a bishop, they start a parallel movement to Dravidianize the South. They start creating the Dravidian identity of the South. And the one group of British are creating the Aryan identity of the North. So this divide it starts there. It's, there's no pre-1800s idea within India that we are two separate groups. There's none of that. It starts like that. So uh, I explain how the quest for German identity creates this notion and the quest for British supremacy over India and legitimizing the East India Company reinforces this idea. And then this is exported to Indians and Indians buy into this. And I explain the whole uh, apparatus of universities and think tanks and census and uh, the media, all of that, which still goes on today. And one of the things that starts 
in the 1800s is called race science. Race, which is today would be considered a bad thing, racism, is considered a science. And the reason it's considered a science is because Darwin had come up with this uh, theory of evolution of species, but he did not apply it to human beings. He was applying it to different kind of species, you know, different animals and whatever. And then Spencer, Herbert Spencer, takes this and starts applying it to human, human civilizations, human societies. Some are more evolved than others. And they go around measuring faces and nice size of nose and skull and all that of all the different people around the world to classify who's more civilized and who's more evolved and so on. And this race science uh, gets to become a very respected European science. And Lord Risley uh, comes to India to uh, come up with the races of India. He wants to come up with how India can be classified into many races and he calls them castes. The caste word is not a Sanskrit word. And he uses the census to classify different jatis. The jatis got turned into castes. They were jatis, but they become castes as a result of that. So 1871, 1881, 1891, every 10 years, Lord Risley's census crystallizes and solidifies what used to be very fluid, turns them into a hierarchy, fixes it. Unfortunately, that's the official classification of castes today. The Indian, uh, India after independence did not say we reject that and we go back to a jati system or, a, or individual hardship system but solidified permanently and today that's taking India apart. So the origin of a lot of these things is the colonial Indology and we accepted that uh, paradigm, the framework that the colonialists were, were using. So. Uh, I also want to talk about the relationship between our Sanskriti, our Dharma civilization and the rest of Asia. It was not just Europe and the Middle East, but it was also Asia. Uh, all, over, all over China, Japan, Mongolia, Korea, Southeast Asia, a huge impact, not only Buddhism, but along with Buddhism, Hinduism and medicine and mathematics, astronomy, uh, agriculture, you know, a whole lot of other things went. Uh, a very interesting quote from the, there's a famous, uh, I, I forgot his name, but a famous Chinese uh, professor at Harvard in the 1930s or whenever the Harvard was doing its 300th anniversary. They were celebrating their 300th anniversary. And they had uh, several days of celebration and every evening there would be a prominent keynote speaker, famous people. They went on celebrating for a long time. And one of the evenings was devoted to this Chinese guy. He was the uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States also, besides being a historian and a professor. And he makes, a, in his speech, he says how India civilized China. That was the theme of his speech, how India civilized China without firing a shot, without an army. He was talking about how a whole lot of Chinese civilization came from India. So, uh, about 2000 and some, uh, I don't know the exact year, when uh, we had a governor in New Jersey called McGreevy, uh, who uh, he was very pro-India, pro-Hindu, he created a Asian commission, uh, brought in people who were you know, different parts of Asia, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, I was Indian. And uh, to uh, help the government on Asian matters. So various committees were formed and I was put chair as of the Asian Studies program to create Asian Studies program in school systems. So one of the things I discovered, it took me, it took about a year to develop the program. Uh, one of the things I discovered was that there was a requirement in the education standards that a certain semester course should be taught on the spread of civilizations in one of the grades, spread of civilization. But when I looked at the course material, it was all spread of European civilization, Western civilization, how they spread civilization to Native Americans, how they spread civilization to Africans, how they spread civilization through colonization, everywhere they're spreading civilization. 
So I said, why don't we, in Asian studies, why don't we talk about the spread of Asian civilization? And I was talking, I was thinking of all these things that they ought to have. So at first they accepted it because it was politically correct to accept it. They all the, uh, the, there were a bunch of, there were a lot of Westerners who were in charge of that uh, commission also, and we were all working together. So they, everybody accepted it. And then when it was time to write down details, they said, well, you know, we've been, we like this idea, but we don't know of any examples. Can you tell us which conqueror, which army was invading, where they were invading? We don't know of any, uh, which Indian conqueror went and invaded. Can you give us facts? The point is they were thinking that spread of civilization means you conquer somebody. Yeah, it's very interesting. To them, it is myth and without proof, unless you have evidence of invasion, somebody killed, conquered, put their flag, took slaves, so many millions of people killed, then you can say, okay, you know, spreading civilization, there is some proof. So I told them that uh, this civilization was spread differently. India was not imposing on others, others were ex receiving, they were pulling it from India. It was the pull rather than push idea of uh, spread. Push is when I'm right, you're wrong, I'm going to push it on you. Pull is when I think I would like to learn from you. So I said, it's like people from the third world go to Harvard today. It's not Harvard with an army spreading its knowledge, but people want to send their bright kids to go and learn, bring it back. So people used to come to Naranda and Takshashila and places like that. And the state of Bihar, Bihar, the word Bihar comes from Vihar. Vihar is Institute of Learning. Vihar had about 20 of these world-class universities which brought a lot of people. Nalanda happens to be better known, but there are a lot of these universities. And many of these people would send the brightest to learn, bring things back. The Queen of Cambodia endowed a whole college be built in Nalanda with facilities to uh, accommodate so people so that she could send the brightest to live there, learn, bring it back. And many Indian uh, works were permanently destroyed when uh, Muhammad Khilji's army came and burnt the, the, the Randa. Libraries were finished, took them three, four months to burn the library, it was so, many, so much manuscript. And somebody asked him, why are you burning this? So he says, uh, if a manuscript contradicts the Quran, then it's blasphemy, it should be burnt. If it agrees with the Quran, it's redundant because the Quran already says it. So it should be burnt, meaning that this is the total knowledge we need, nothing else is necessary. It's probably a threat, maybe bad. So this is how it went on. So if you are trying to look for all the ancient manuscripts of India, you will find most of the surviving manuscripts are in Tibetan translated or Chinese translated or Mongolian translated. And those students were so loyal, they were not plagiarists, they were not trying to claim that this is their own, like Europeans who have taken things from India try to claim it as their own. Like what you call Pythagoras theorem is actually Bodhaniya's theorem, okay? And a lot of pre-calculus came from uh, the Kerala school, but attributed to Leibniz and Newton and so on. But the Asians were borrowing very honestly. So you find many Tibetan texts start off by saying that this is the translation of such and such Sanskrit text. You find many Chinese texts like that. So there's a project near Sarnath uh, where they are taking some Tibetan texts and translating them back to Sanskrit to restore the original Sanskrit from which they were derived. And there's a lot of such works in, in Chinese now, which could be, one could do such things. So. If you compile uh, what survived in the original Indian languages, it's a very trivial percent. But we know that more exists because of references, bibliography. They were very good at refer referring to another person. But that previous person be re being referred to, we can't find anything. So we know it existed. And so we sometimes find it in another Asian language. So Asia was pretty much a, with Indian civilization as its mother, like Greece is considered the mother of 
European thought, European civilization. The religious thought from Jerusalem, which is the Hebraic, you know, Jewish origin, and the rational thought, enlightenment thought, Renaissance thought from Greece. That those are the two parts of European thought. So similarly, one of the large, largest sources of pan-Asian thought and civilization has been India. And the Asian countries don't have a problem. I met a professor at Columbia who is now at Harvard, Ruchi Abhi, in a conference I organized on these things, India's contributions to the world. He told me things I didn't know. He said that these uh, uh, martial arts, he was telling me the origin, he was telling me that the language of uh, uh, you know Japan, we, because the characters look different, we don't recognize it, but a large Sanskrit influence. He was telling me that most of the Hindu deities, if you go to Kyoto, and then I went to Kyoto, he said uh, the priest who is knowledgeable will tell you this is Ganesh, this is Durga, they have different names for it. So it's quite amazing, rather than hiding, which is the reaction I get from Westerners when I tell them Indian origins. Uh, he was actually telling me more than I knew and he was quite proud of it. I also met uh, Chinese at a Vedanta Congress that we sponsored. A delegation came from China, huge delegation. I thought these guys must have smuggled themselves out of China, maybe the government would not be allowing it. But he said, no, we are funded by the government, we are studying our history and a large part of our ideas and philosophy came from India, we studied. So they didn't have any problem about it. It is the Indians and especially the government who have a very serious problem acknowledging it. They think that we might be accused of chauvinism, we better not serve, we are secular, we can't talk like that. They said you like that. So in 2005, there was a World Sanskrit Congress in Thailand. The crown princess, who is the daughter of the king, was the patron, the convener. And a year or two before the Congress, and she wanted to inaugurate a journal of Sanskrit studies and a college of Sanskrit studies in her country. And for that she wanted to hold a world conference. So I got a call from a Delhi University professor, Amarjeev Lochan is his name, very dynamic young sort of enterprising fellow. And the Thai people had uh, commissioned him to bring Indian participation. So he went to the Indian government, at that time a BJP government, and tried to convince them that you should also co-sponsor it because it will look good. They think of India as the mother civilization, you should co-sponsor it, It'll, they will like it. And the Indian government said, no, we are not interested. The Indian government said, no. So this guy was very embarrassed because you know he had to go back to Thailand and tell them, no, Indian is interested. They would say, well, what is, because you know, imagine somebody uh, wanting to start a college of French studies. The French government would love it. Or imagine if you are studying a st center for Russian studies, the Russians would fund it. Or if you want to set up a study of China, the Chinese government would fund it. India is the only place where it is embarrassed that somebody wants to, to respect us. It, like we are so ashamed, we can't be respected, it must be something wrong. So he came to me and he said, Rajiv, you, you Infinity Foundation should sponsor it. We will tell them Indian, Indians are sponsoring it. So I said, how I live in US, I am a lot of tiny foundation, how can you take a little bit teeny amount that I can afford and call it that this is from the people of India, you know, how can that be? He says, this is the best we can do, so at least it will save pace. So I agreed to a very small financial component, but I said, I can give you a lot of time, a lot of ideas, I can participate in the thinking, I can do that. So we spent a long time. And we developed a program and we had a letter agreement between the Thai government and myself in which the Thai princess and myself would be the two conveners of this event. So everything was set, huge program, a lot of international people coming. A month before the program, I get a panicked email, phone call from this gentleman in Delhi saying that uh, there is a change. I said, what has changed? He says, the HRD minister wants to replace you as the co-convener. <laughs> you see, I done all the hard work. Once they realize it's successful, then they want to come and get the limelight, get the pictures, get the press and look like they are great guys, you know. So I said, nothing doing. I, I, you can't throw me out. I mean, I have, I have a letter. I have an agreement. 
So I put my foot down and but he says the pressure is very strong, they'll throw me in jail, they'll say I've done something wrong, I should not have blah blah all that, you know. So eventually a compromise was reached that there'll be three conveners. So the Crown Princess, myself and the Murli Manor Joshi we were three conveners of this event. They hadn't done one darn thing about it. I had worked hard. So the event happens, I give the opening address on geopolitics and Sanskrit. That was the first paper in that first journal issue on which they started. And it's available on Suleka.com if you go. So after this conference, there is a nice banquet the Indian MS Indian MSC throws because now Indian MSC wants from you know publicity because it's become high profile. So we are sitting there and the Indian ambassador, first secretary, all these people are sitting there. So I asked them a question, a very ordinary question. I said, what is Ministry of External Affairs strategy of export of Sanskriti as part of foreign policy to ASEAN countries which think they call their language Bahasa. In Indonesia it's called Bahasa. In Malaysia it's called Bahasa. They think they are, their civilization comes from India. They have Ramayan painted everywhere. Huh? So they think India is the mother civilization. What is the strategy to leverage this as part of foreign policy? To build bondage, to build bond and trade and friendship. None of them have an answer. They are looking at each other, sir, 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 we are secular, sir, we don't know. Yeah. What a disgrace. I mean, you're afraid of your language, you're afraid of your history, you're afraid of your civilization, because secular means to a lot of Indians, cut off from your past, cut off from the roots of who you are, because it's something to be embarrassed about. That's how disgraceful it is. So, uh, I've been, I used to have businesses in many of these countries, so I used to go there, uh, go there on a regular basis. and. Uh, it's also interesting how they've adapted the Indian texts and Indian stories for their own local context. So for instance, if you go to Thailand, you will find that it's a Buddhist country, of course, but still they have Ramayana everywhere. So how have they reconciled? It's very interesting. I don't know if you've ever researched that. But you know, when they have Buddha statue inside a Buddhist temple, Outside is Ravan. Ravan. Huge, tall, fine, tough guy, Ravan. So I, every time guy would say, this is Ravana, this is Ravana, like that. So I said, why is Ravan standing here? He said, oh, we worship the Ravana. I said, but you, you just showed me the whole Ramayan, you worship Ravana. So why, where is Ravana? You also explained that Ravana was bad guy. They have the whole Ramayana correct. So here is the adaptation. They said, this is the Thai interpretation, how to reconcile Ramayana with Buddhism. After Ravana dies, he repents. He goes to, uh, he goes to Ishwar. He goes to Vishnu. He goes to Vishnu and he says, I am sorry for what I did but I want another chance and I'll serve you. I want to serve you. Uh, so he is given another birth to protect the Buddha. So Vishnu is born as Buddha, the next incarnation, and Ravana is born as a tough guy who is his bodyguard. So this is Ravana 2.0 and he's protecting Buddha. So without having to deny their heritage, their past, they've beautifully integrated it into that, okay, you guys in India know Ramayana, but we also know 2.0, because there's reincarnation, so all these guys get born again, so we know the next story also. <laughs> so this is very interesting. You see, every time I went there, I found that during the day I'd have business discussions with these guys. Now in Indonesia, Muslims, but deep down, they have great respect for India, Indian civilization. They have their Hindu name, 
they name like Sita, you know, Radha, these kind of streets are named like that, banks are named like that. They have a monkey forest, monkey forest, it's sacred monkeys. Tourists will take you there, you buy uh, peanuts and you feed those monkeys, a lot of monkeys in the forest. So you ask them, why are they sacred, who are these monkeys? They said, this is Hanuman's army. So you say, how did Hanuman's army end up here? So they say that when he was bringing the mountain, he was, took a long tour and one part of the mountain fell in the ocean, became the island. That is our island, is Hanuman, uh, Himalayan fall and fell down. I mean, Hanuman didn't have a GPS or something. So these are monkeys from Hanuman's descendants. And they are feeling like that. In Thailand, there's a town called Ayodhya. A town called Ayodhya. So you see, their sacred geography, their sense of history, their names, their language, their lifestyle is so inseparable from Mother India, more respectful than most Indians are respecting their heritage. I went to uh, uh, Angkor Wat, what a great uh, uh, place it is, you know. So uh, it is quite interesting that while Indians have disowned in the name of modernity and in the name of progress, they have disowned who we are. Uh, this idea is preserved, these lot of things about Indian civilization, you can get more authentic versions when you go elsewhere. You go around the uh, old Hindu temples, there is about 2000 Hindu temples in Cambodia, most of them sitting in ruins. You really go spend a day each and look at all the carvings and what is being written and what does this mean, that mean. You will get a phenomenal new insight and new ideas about our history, which has been destroyed in India but still preserved in those countries because they did not get invaded and destroyed in the same way, you see. So, I feel that uh, when you are talking about Sanatan Dharma and the West, some of the relationships are direct with the West. Some are indirect through the Arabs. Some are through Asia. And when the East Asian countries, since they are advancing and rising, it is very important for India to reconnect with that, you know. And, and unfortunately that is, uh, that is being lost. Uh, ten years ago I did a survey, uh, I found that in China, because in China they do everything very they systematically analyze and when they decide to target they really go after it. So they looked at yoga for health, yoga, meditation, all this stuff for health and they did their own clinical studies and they figured out that it's a very useful thing. So one Chinese guy in one of these conferences about our tradition, our civilization, Chinese guy was just sitting over dinner telling me these things and he said Chinese government has targeted that we need 500,000 yoga teachers in China, 500,000. He just made a casual remark. So I went and talked to all these big Hindu gurus saying you should supply. There is an export market. You can supply IITs to supply technocrat, you can create uh, 50 yoga kind of IITs and supplies and 500,000 teachers, you have a huge economy. They all laughed at me. Or they said, ah, I've got five guys there, small thinking, small thinking. In a more recent conference on yoga, where I met Chinese people also, they've started building up their capacity. Guess who is supplying yoga teachers? Americans. Yeah. It's a whole lot of Christian yoga, Americanized yoga, white guys who become the gurus here, started huge franchise in China. So, a made in India product is being remade, recharacterized as made in USA being sold there. Yeah, that's what it is. So, culture and civilization, when you lose it, you lose a sense of who you are, you may lose your unity, you may lose a sense of your sovereignty, it's also an economic disempowerment. You are losing your clout and your soft power in, a, in the world, especially in those countries which respect the, these ideas and you, you are not even willing to be a supplier. Kind of very strange. So, I will not uh, take more time because I want more Q&A, but I'll just make a few more points and then we'll have questions. Uh, the modern recent decades relationship between Sanatan Dharma and the West is again complex, like before. There is a lot of 
appropriation of yoga, meditation, vegetarianism, animal rights, ecofeminism, many ideas, Gandhian ideas of localization of food by local, which has become very popular in this country, decentralization, you know, this old dharmic idea of decentralized governance, these kind of things, small scale, becoming popular here as a lifestyle. Uh, and uh, conserv you know, conservation, live frugally, live simple, this sort of a thing. But in parallel, there are some other trends that are disturbing that I want to talk about. One is a trend, I coined the term Hindu phobia in the American Academy. And I've written the book, Invading the Sacred. And ironically, the chief characters are based in Chicago. It's not the Chicago mob. It's a different kind of mob. And I've had a more than a decade long uh, combat with these people in the University of Chicago. And if you mention my name, they'll uh, say, oh my God, you know Rajiv Malhotra, oh my God. So, but I've had this argument because I found that a whole lot of abuse of uh, our deities, our gurus, our symbols, Ganesh, Goddess, Ramakrishna, he's, he was called a homosexual, Vivekananda is called a homosexual by these people. I mean, not only these mar people are marginal characters, they're mainstream scholars with, uh, who get a lot of awards. And their books are read everywhere, and they're big shot professors and chairmen and all that, the various departments. May I finish, please? You can ask the question later. Yeah. I know that you know. I, I said, may I finish first? I know that you know, but it will disrupt my talk. Everything I'm saying, you could, I'm sure, jump in, but that is what Q&A is for. So we will talk about it. Yeah. In Q&A, you can say anything you want, but I won't, don't want to lose my continuity, please. Yeah. So this Hindu phobia uh, is a term that describes a, not a few casual, trivial people here and there, but a very systematic study uh, uh, applying certain Western criteria and standards to make Hinduism look weird in such a way that children would be embarrassed to study. They would rather be disowning such a culture, which is why many of our kids disown it because it's what what is study about it is not the kind of things I'm pointing out, but what is bad about it. That's how it's study. This is Hindu phobia. I spent 15 years and I moved on because I have so many things to do. Beyond Hindu phobia, I wrote a book last year called Breaking India, which talks about Western systematic interventions into, in India to divide up India, Dravidianization of India, Dalit movement minorities being studied and you know how they are being oppressed give a reason to intervene through human rights law like that. Not that we don't have these problems, but so does the United States. So does China, but they don't intervene in China. Every year when they produce a human rights report criticizing China, within 10 days China produces a human rights report criticizing the United States. China has its own uh, reversing the gaze on America, saying, okay, we, we know about you, what are you doing here, there, there, there. India apologizes and says, no, 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 please don't put us on your way, on your watch list and all that stuff. Please forgive us, we do better job next time. Salam to you, please. Yeah. Yeah? China doesn't take uh, that uh, attitude. China gets respect because it's strong. Uh, the breaking India is on how missionaries, are creating a sense of breaking the Indian identity into several identities that are fighting each other. Uh, and and uh, the human rights activism from the United States, backed by the government, backed by various uh, secular organizations, academic, media type, think tank organizations, how they are supporting it. And the book gives you more than a hundred names and of individuals and organizations in the United States who are doing this kind of work and what they are doing and you can read it and you know understand it. And I am not afraid to name names because I am sure of my data and if they have a problem they can call me and I will be happy to discuss. And if there is any correction I will make the correction but so far we haven't, people have challenged us and we have been able to give them evidence so they haven't, we haven't come up with any uh, non-trivial uh, correction that uh, is required so far. Um, 
Another thing that I am concerned about, I call it the digestion, which will be the topic tomorrow, the digestion of uh, dharmic civilization into the West, which means that if you eat it and you transform it and reclassify it as part of the West and you discard it, you discard the source. And how a lot of things in the past have been digested and we were told we are no good and now this is happening with many, many things, many spiritual things, many, many cultural things, they are being digested and the source is being thrown out. So a digested civilization lives in museums like pagans, like Native Americans, like uh, Egyptian civilization, you know, Tibetan civilization might get digested into China and it will live in a museum, people will be saying, tourist guides will be saying, this is a museum of how the Tibetans used to live, but they no longer survive and all that stuff. So we are being digested. Uh, I show this in this book, Being Different, because being different is an antidote to being digested. And I will explain this, uh, this tomorrow. So what I would like at this point is to uh, stop my discussion and uh, listen to your comments. And, but I'd like some questions and then that way we can continue our conversation. Thank you very much.